Welcome to the Love and Lattes podcast, a coffee lover's guide to good vibes, books, rom-coms, and everything in between. Now grab some coffee and let's get chatting. Hi, everyone. I'm Graham McTavish. I do a bit of acting, a bit of writing, a bit of bourbon producing, and you are joining me on Love and Lattes. Thank you so much for talking with me today. I am excited to talk with you because, my goodness, you're so busy. I have been like reading about everything you're doing, and I hope you have like a personal assistant to keep you on track because you have something <laughs> going on all the time. I, I don't actually. Um, I'm keeping busy uh, one way or another. It's it's the way I like it. Yeah. So. Yes, that's you want to be busy and doing different things. As long as you have a good Google Calendar and color coding, you'll be fine. I carry it all in my head. I hand make calendars. So I actually find that more helpful for me actually than doing it on a computer. You know, if it works for you, that's all that matters and you're getting it done. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So I wanted to start off with something. I know like if people have read the first two books that you have co-written, it's a well-known fact that you like lattes. And so I think it's kind of fun for you to be on the Love and Lattes podcast. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I do. Yeah, I do. I don't know. I don't know when this really began for me. It's just a fixed part of my day, really. Probably have two, sometimes three. In New Zealand, I have flat whites because I don't know why. I just, when I'm in New Zealand, I have flat whites. When I'm not in New Zealand, I have lattes. Yeah, I I do. I like it. I mean, coffee didn't really come into, well, not espresso coffee anyway, into my life probably until gosh maybe the early 2000s i mean in london you you just couldn't get it really it was very hard yeah, there was one decent really good coffee shop called the monmouth coffee house on monmouth street in Covent garden and they did espresso coffee and i would meet there with my friend but that was it that was it everything else it was tea people drank tea so you know when i started out in theater you would have coffee breaks or tea breaks and on the table there would be tea bags or there would be a jar of instant coffee and that would be it and you just took your choice and but yeah i mean now you can't move for coffee shops they're everywhere so which is which i love of course and i am an expert in finding good ones i am i'm very good at finding coffee shops good coffee shops that's so nice when you find like a little small shop, maybe like off the beaten path and they have the best coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, uh, yes, there are things that give it away sometimes. Design, location, what the staff look like, I often go on. The kind of vibe that's coming out of it. And so you know pretty well before you even tasted anything, whether it's going to be any good. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's part of my life. It's my daily routine is um getting coffee yeah yes you can't go wrong with a nice cup of coffee well i was gonna say it's kind of it's a controversial thing some people really like it and some people don't but how do you feel about the pumpkin spice latte oh no 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 this is abomination this is an abomination (laughs) no 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 i i no i mean I, i would personally you would never see me in a coffee shop that served a pumpkin spice latte that it would just never happen the coffee shops I go to do not serve pumpkin spice lattes, the seasonal latte or whatever it is. What's the other one? There's pumpkin spice and there's a, there's a the cook. No. What's the one they do for Christmas? Like peppermint mochas? Oh, no, 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 no. This is wrong. This is just, they're just, they're just big sugary drinks. There's a sugar. It's just a sugar with coffee in it. You know, I think there's far too much sugar in our lives anyway so the if you can if you can avoid it in a coffee shop you're doing well but coffee coffee like many things nowadays especially in the uh, food retail world is dedicated to giving you sugar that's that's what they do they put it in everything especially in america i have to say so i avoid the pumpkin spice latte yes it's kind of hard to know like if you're drinking like a sugary kind of coffee drink, are you getting your energy from the sugar or from the caffeine? There's no way to know. It's affecting different parts of your body, I suppose. 
I would say, I mean, unless you're drinking loads of caffeine in a day, the sugar is the thing you need to worry about, not the caffeine. Yeah. Yes, just just watch both of those. If you have high blood pressure or something and, and you know, got to watch your blood sugar level, you got to pay attention to what kind of coffee drink you're drinking. But anyway, this is a whole, you could talk all about coffee. Oh, for yeah, an hour. Yeah, totally. Yes, 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 absolutely. You could. Yes, it's a fun thing. Coffee is so fun. I tried to give it up recently because I've been drinking it forever. And it's like kind of becoming really acidic. Um, and so it's like, I'm like, what do I do? But it's hard not to drink it. It's like a routine. Like you look forward to it every morning. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. I do. I do. Yes, yes. It's one of, it's one of the few things that I would uh, find almost impossible to give up, to be honest. Yeah. It's just a good part of life, makes you happy, um, which is why I named this Love and Lattes podcast, because you got to love a latte. But um, anyway, just had to bring that up. Okay, so let's talk about one of your many projects you have going on. So season two of Men and Kills recently came out on Stars, and now we have another book coming out that's associated with it. I had to write it down because it's a long title. It's it Clanlands in New Zealand, Kiwis, Kilts, and an Adventure Down Under. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Because it has all of those things in it. Yeah, it was certainly uh, an adventure down under. I mean, I, as you know, lived part of the time in New Zealand. So it was great. It was great to have Sam come to that adopted country and show him and actually show him really how similar it is to Scotland, which is one of the reasons that we went there. And then he proceeded to basically try and terrify me for uh, the entire shoot with the things that he wanted me to do. So, you know, zip lining, cutting shark cage diving, bungee jumping off a of a cliff. And yeah, it was um it was tiring. It was tiring. My my amygdala never really recovered from it. It was quite distressing. But it was fun. It was fun. And we were very, very lucky with the weather. Apart from the day we went to see the dolphin. The day we went to see the dolphins, it was terrible weather. Yeah. The dolphins were fine. They were having a great time. But uh, we, however, were drenched. Yes. But it was okay. Gosh, you did so, so many things. Beautiful landscape. I, I myself don't know much about New Zealand. At least I didn't before watching mm. the second season. It's such yeah. a beautiful country and the culture right. is amazing. Like, yeah. I think what I was going to say is I watch a lot of travel shows because I've never traveled. So this is like a great way for people to kind of to travel, but it's mm. like both educational and entertaining. That's what's so mm. great about mm. the show. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we try and do both. We do try and do both. And we try and do both in the book. I mean, the book is, we talk in detail about our experiences of doing the show. But more than that, we talk about the history of New Zealand and particularly the, the history of the settlement of Scots and Irish and English that came over in the mainly in the 19th century. Uh, and And really just how that has shaped the country and the similarities between clan culture and Maori culture, the the tribalism that echoes the tribalism in the highlands, they're, they're not terribly dissimilar. And that's why you find a great many Highlanders of, uh, who came over in the 19th century uh, intermarried with Maori women uh, because they saw in each other something very, very recognizable. They ended up marrying each other. So, yeah. Compared to New Zealand, America is uh, is an ancient land in terms of its settlement. New Zealand is, it's been about 200 years, two, less than 200 years, that they've had proper uh, European settlement there. And it's, it's an amazing country because of it, because it was completely isolated for, gosh, when the Maori came, I guess they came in the, they think in around the 13th or 14th century is when they found New Zealand. And before that, there were no humans on New Zealand at all, none, which I think it certainly historically places it in a unique uh, position. And then the Māori were there uh, in complete isolation for about 500 years. And that fascinates me, the, the idea of, of a culture that has grown in isolation while the rest of the world was moving in a completely different direction. And then those two worlds collide and and everything that happens, happens. And it's it's very interesting to me. 
like even reading like the first clan lands book, you go really in detail on things that you couldn't, I guess, have time to touch on in the series. So yeah. I imagine this book, the second clan lands book, well, I guess the third one, technically it's going to probably go really in depth. And I bet you had so much fun. It's really like diving deep into this amazing culture. Yes, I did. I really did. And I mean, one of the things that they have in common, the Highlanders and the Maori people, they're a warrior culture, basically. And as such, they were constantly fighting each other. And uh, that's, you know, the, what I talk about or what we talk about in the first book and the second book is reflected in the third book with with how the culture was there pre the European arrival and post the European arrival. I mean, given the cultural differences between the people there, once the Europeans arrived, it's a miracle that it went as well as it did, really. You know, I, I try and explain it in the book that if you were if you were a Scottish family coming from Greenock in Scotland, you know, an industrial, coming from a very poor family, probably needing a change, needing to find an opportunity somewhere else. And you got on a ship and you went to New Zealand in 1840 or 1830. You were going to be on that ship for the best part of 120 days. You wouldn't see land, really. The journey would have been utterly appalling you know the vermin the pests the the conditions most people were just given a bedroll that was soaking wet most of the time because of the rain and then the water would run out after a certain point and they would catch water in in sort of tarpaulins to be able to drink the food was appalling you know some people died on the journey and as i say in the book you know imagine now you getting on a plane to go on a long distance journey knowing that a certain proportion of your plane would be dead by the time you got there. And it's it's just impossible for us to imagine. And so you have them traveling that gigantic distance, bringing with them a European sensibility, a, a European understanding of the world and all the rest of it. And then they arrive in a place where they are met by what is essentially a Stone Age culture, a culture that didn't have metal tools, they didn't have the wheel, they were living in a sort of complete isolation. And so men barely dressed, covered in tattoos, facial tattoos, carrying war clubs and spears, meet your boat arriving from Greenock. And then you look at it from the Maori point of view. There they are. They've been living for 500 years, never seen anybody else apart from other Maori people who they've had fights with. And then this giant ship arrives with cannons I mean, they didn't have gunpowder. You know, they had cannons. And this is in the 19th century. And so that collision, uh, I would love, well, I mean, there are accounts of what people thought when they saw each other. And an interesting point that I make in the book is that Māori is in fact not a word to cover the people. Māori is a word in the language of Toreo, which is the language that they speak because um, Māori people didn't have a notion of nationhood, similar to the way clans and Highlanders didn't have a notion of being Scottish. They were McDonald's, they were Campbell's, they were this, they were that. So same with the Māori, they were, they were their tribes. They were, they were not going to be familiar with the kind of world that was being introduced to them by, by the Europeans. And it was very difficult. It was very, very difficult when they first met to understand each other, how they viewed the world. And that's part of what I talk about in the book. That's wild. You should have a degree in history. I think you would enjoy just like sitting <laughs> and learning all of this information. Well, it's fascinating to me, I suppose, because uh, I think we have many preconceptions about the past or assumptions rather, uh, assumptions about the past. And that the past is a much more varied and interesting landscape than the one that we ascribe to it most of the time. It's very not black and white. It's very, it's very complex. And uh, I think that's what history teaches us is, is the complexity of, of human life. And when, you know, people who have nothing in common encounter each other, you know, it, it can be bad. 
Uh, but equally, you look at New Zealand now, it's a peaceful country. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's re remarkable, really. It truly is. You know, like a 23andMe and like Ancestry.com, mm -hmm. you can kind of dive deep into your own personal um, history. But like mm -hmm. with clan lands and men in kilts and even something like Outlander, a lot of people I feel like today, they're just so caught up in their daily lives, their jobs, mm -hmm. their families. They don't even think about like maybe where they came from or their neighbors come from or their coworkers. And these shows give you like an appreciation for these amazing cultures, like so far outside of your own life, but you never sure. know like what connections you or people around you might have to them. And I think it's such a great way to like open audiences minds to the world. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And the, and the huge variation that exists within it. I've just come back from a trip to Austria. I was in Austria for a little bit, uh, visiting a friend there. Austria is a European country. But the culture is very different. It's very different from the British culture. You arrive there and in this particular part of Austria, for instance, they, the men quite commonly wear lederhosen. They just wear it, you know, like a, like a Scotsman would wear a kilt. And in fact, more, I would argue that more people in that region of Austria wear their traditional dress than they do in Scotland. And you, you, you look around and you go, wow, I mean, this is the 21st century and and people are walking around in clothes that actually the lederhosen is passed down from generation to generation. So the older it is, the more valuable it is. So, for instance, I met the mayor of the local village and his lederhosen was over 100 years old. And there he was wearing it. And you go, that's so amazing to me that that, that culture is very, very alive and well and really respected. I do love that when you go to other countries and really encounter their own culture, that it's valued. And I like, I really like that. In Men in Kilts, and I'm sure it will be brought up in the book, I love how welcoming the Maori people were to having, I guess, I don't want to call it outsiders, but like um, maybe people outside of their culture, they wanted to share it and they wanted people yeah. to learn about it. And I think that's how you keep traditions and cultures alive by helping other people become aware of it because like you said they were isolated for so many years and yes, yes. nowadays I think people are very interested and they want to learn I think some people are I think some people could benefit from being more interested because when you learn about another culture in the way that we did when we went on the Marai and we met with Inia and all the other lovely people there is that that something that is very unfamiliar to you and somewhat you're completely unused to it. it it makes you not fear it you you grow to understand it and through understanding your fear or your trepidation whatever you want to call it diminishes and that's you know in understanding each other and seeing things in each other's culture that's that's how you avoid conflict as part from anything being open to new things and just that that's the best thing just have an open mind and you never know well, who you might meet yeah. and become best friends with I always say that just yeah. because you're different doesn't mean you can't like connect no I think you yes it's important to connect and I think it doesn't mean that you necessarily want to adopt the culture or or you know make it part of your own life or anything like that but you understand it and you respect it and and it's a mutual respect and that uh that is what allows people to live in harmony with each other, to have things mutually respected. I mean, there were things about Māori culture when Europeans arrived that was quite difficult for Europeans to reconcile. But you have to, there's a story that I tell, which I won't tell you about now, but there's a story of, a, of an American painter that goes to a Māori community in the early 19th century and, and really has to learn the hard way about respecting the culture that he finds himself in and that's that's another interesting part of it um is that we bring with us baggage you know literal baggage and and emotional baggage and uh and you encounter people with different different amounts of baggage different types of baggage that you have to go oh okay well their baggage is a bit different from mine but you know it's it's a very interesting learning process yeah for everybody 
Well, I can tell you're very passionate about New Zealand and that's obviously yes. why you moved there. You love it so much. And it's yes. just so fascinating. Yes. No, it is. It is fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. It is. You mentioned you, you participated in some very interesting activities, some a bit calmer than others and some a bit more um, adrenaline rushing than mm. others, but what mm. was your favorite activity while in filming Men and Kilt? And what was your least favorite? Favorite activity, probably visiting Black Barn Vineyard. That was very lovely. Very calm, very relaxing, nice wine, beautiful landscape, just, you know, a nice meal, quiet. And then my least favorite, well, I mean, the thing is, I did all these, you know, scary things, certainly things that I found scary, but I don't regret doing any of them because, uh, you know, I'm all for challenging you yourself and being adventurous. So I didn't dis you know didn't not want to do any of them after i'd done them i was glad i did them i wouldn't be rushing to go shark cage diving again i wouldn't rush to do the never swing although having done it now once i could probably cope more the second time because it's it is the fear of the unknown that is always the thing that gets you when you're going into a shark cage and you've never used a regulator. You've never seen a great white shark come that close to you. You've never, you know, all of the nevers. Once you've got past those nevers, it's like, oh, okay, well, it wasn't that bad. And it helps you in the future, I think, with other challenges, perhaps, that you'll encounter. Uh, so I don't, I, I didn't hate any of it at all. No, not at all. It was very exhilarating. And very tiring at times, because when your when your system's being flooded with that amount of adrenaline, I mean, we did did the jet boat, the 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 fast kind of low dune buggy thing, and the never swing all in one day, and and that was by the time I did the never swing, by the time I'd finished it, I was completely exhausted because your nervous system has just been shredded. It it, it was a lot of fun. I, I would be lying if I didn't say it was. It was it was a lot of fun. It's one of those things. Like once you're on the other side of it, you're like, okay, wasn't as bad as I thought, but my gosh, it made for entertaining television. And you were a very brave person. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. None of it. No acting required at all. That there, there, there was real fear, real, real fear. But I mean, weirdly, the most dangerous thing that we did was something that didn't seem like it would be that dangerous was the Ray Ray rock slide, which you only see a tiny bit of in the show. We talk more about it in the book. You know, everything else is controlled. You have harnesses, you have, you have people that are looking after your safety. This, you just literally get a boogie board and you go out into this precipitous rock slide and just slide down into a six meter pool at the end and you know you're like oh when I went and did it I didn't read the sign on the way down which was basically warning you of possible death injury drowning you know people have drowned it just talks about it all and you go wow so that was probably that was probably the most dangerous thing that we did Sam might disagree but it was the least controlled so yeah that was interesting that's so true. I wouldn't have thought of that. No harnesses, no safety gear. It's just nothing. Yeah, yeah. my gosh. Go out there and slide down. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, I think you both had a lot of fun. I think everyone would love a third season of Men and Kilt. Is there like anything that works? And is there a country you would like to explore if there was a third season? We'd both love to do it again. We really would. It's a very enjoyable experience. And I think people enjoy watching it. So, uh, you know, I think it's about tying our schedules together. Uh, but if we do it, I think both of us want to do it in North America. The idea would be to really go down the east coast of the United States. Well, starting in Nova Scotia, actually, Canada, and coming south. So going through New York State, you know, going coming across maybe to like uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, North Carolina, all, all of those sort of areas where there was a big, big Scottish influence. If If we had time... I would love to go across to Montana 
which has a very high population of Scottish ancestry. There are people there who are the descendants of the McDonald's that came over from Glencoe. So, you know, they, they're still there. And they intermarried with the Native American population there. And so you've got lots of people with the surname McDonald walking around. And it's just, it's really interesting. So I'd love to do that. Yeah, and that's, that's where we will do it if, if, it, if it comes to pass. How fun. Well, I hope there is that Me opportunity too. for you. I'm Me sure too. you would both enjoy it and find some fun activities to participate in. And speaking of like kind of going on an American excursion, I know you have coming up um, the next, like, I guess, month, you're going to be going to different places in yeah. the United States to promote McTavish spirits. So that's exciting. Yeah, 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 it is. It is. I mean, I'm really looking forward to it. It's a new thing. And it, I'm going to parts of America that I've never been to before, Wisconsin, Never been to Wisconsin in November. Who knows what that's going to be like? I love Kentucky. So I've been there before and really looking forward to that. We're going to be in Texas. I did do a show in Dallas once, but I've never been to um, Austin or Houston. And so I'm really looking forward to exploring parts of America that I've never seen before and, and meeting, meeting lots of, you know, new people. Because in doing something like this, you meet a whole different type of person a different, you know, with different interests, you know, what I've learned about it through the process of, of doing this. It's introduced me to a whole, whole other world. And it's really interesting. It's a very, very passionate world, very supportive, very supportive people. You know, I bumped into Ian Summerholder at the Bourbon and Beyond Festival. And one of the lovely things about it was that the first thing he did was come up to me and congratulate me but also to really support me in it, you know, offer his help and um, any advice and all the rest of it. And that's, that's something that I found very, very common in that community. They love bourbon. And, and so they want it to all be good. And so they want to help people make good bourbon. And that's, uh, I, I, I love that. It's, it's very, very supportive. Oh, that's so nice. Well, you're going to have so much fun and you should come up with a bourbon latte. That should be your new thing. <laughs> oh, yes. What an excellent idea. That's Who a knows? really good idea. There was something that I thought, really? They've combined those two things together. I can't remember what it was. But anyway, excellent idea. I will I will look into it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you should. Oh, I will say one thing. I think you will absolutely love Austin. It's such a oh. neat place. Everyone's oh. moving to Austin from yeah, like yeah. Hollywood. So yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. A lot of people in, have moved to Texas. I know people have moved to Texas. So I'm really looking forward to it. I can't wait, actually. City I've always wanted to go to. Oh, you'll have so much fun. It's such a neat place downtown. Um, it's the hill country. So, and it's fall, oh. maybe, I don't know if it's really fall in Texas ever, because it's like a hundred degrees all the time, but maybe you'll get to see some fall leaves um, on the trees down there. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, well, I'll definitely see some in Kentucky. So that's true. That's, that's something. Yes. And I'll include the links in the description so people can see all the locations you're going to and also buy some of your bourbon. That's uh, yes. the end of the book. Yes. So lots of things yes. to look into. Thank you. Thank you. And it, yeah, it's lovely talking to you. And uh, I really look forward to visiting the Lone Star State very soon. I heard you do like a Southern accent in the show. So uh, I'm not going to do that out. now. No, <laughs> no, I saved that. Yeah, no, that's yeah, I do, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty. Uh, it gets a bit wild, but uh, it's fun. It's it's. I blame my friend Nolan North. He got me into it. He got me into bourbon as well. He's a great actor, mainly voice actor, but he's a great actor and uh, a dear friend. And he got me into both those things: bourbon and southern accents. So. Right, the two things that go perfectly together. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they right. really do. I tell you what. Okay, so we'll finish up really quickly with rapid fire questions. Yes. Okay. What is the last show you binge watched? Oh, uh, Succession. I love that show. Yes, it's great. And then what's your favorite ice cream flavor? Oh, it used to be, there's a New Zealand one called Hokey Pokey that uh, is really nice. If it's really good, that's a, that's a really good one. Otherwise, I'm more of a kind of gelato sort of slash sorbet guy. Uh, I love Italian ice cream, so I, I tend to go for, like, you know, kind of plum sorbet or something like that. Yes. 
Yeah. It's so different than like your traditional ice cream. So yes, great choice. Um, <laughs> and are you a dog person or a cat person? I'm a dog person. Yes. Very much. I love dogs. Yeah. Oh, they're great. Um, and then finally, you've traveled many places, but where is one place you have yet to visit? I would love to go to Iceland. I've never been there. My daughter's going there next year, and I really want to go to Iceland. I, I, there's something about it that just draws me to it, and I need to get it out of my system. So Iceland is the place that I would love to go to. You've got to tag along with your daughter on that trip? I don't think she wants me to tag along with her on her trip, no. She's only 16. You know, the idea of her dad wandering around with all her friends in Iceland, probably not the best time for, for her, so no. I'll go another time. But no, I know they, they want to have their Icelandic adventure, but hopefully you have one yourself soon. Exactly. I hope so too. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today, Graham. This yeah. has been so much fun, but I really appreciate your time today. Not at all. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Oh, good. Well, um, thank you again and have a great rest of your day. Congratulations on everything. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much. Bye, Bye. for now. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you can be notified of all the new episodes. I truly appreciate your support. Thank you so much for listening to the Love and Lattes podcast. Have a great day.